Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of all combat sports. He's the legend, Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? I'm good. You know, everybody knows that I don't, uh, I don't know nothing about that thing called the internet, and um, very little. So I tweeted my tweeting team, the best in the world. You know, the special people that they are. They set up my tweets Saturday during all the action from afternoon to night, starting with UFC, going into boxing over across the pond. We had a good night of tweeting. And towards, we'll talk about it later, but later in the night, there was, I talked about, I sent out a tweet that um, somebody responded to. And, uh, I'm starting to know how you feel like when you get attacked all the time. When um, <laughs> I don't get attacked often, well, but I see well, every yeah. attack. Yeah. <laughs> and I wish and, it didn't bother me. <laughs> well, no, but I don't see them, so it can't bother me. And I don't know, they don't bother me that much anyway, even when I get told about it. But this one I got told about, and it was just a silly thing, and it's probably more silly than I'm talking about it. But... Um, somebody got it. It's a job. Someone got to do it, right? So somebody responded to my tweet that the welterweight division is loaded, which it is, and I would love to see uh, Santion, who I was very impressed with. We'll talk about him later. <laughs> I'd like to see him fight Virgil Ortiz. I made a mistake. I said Victor Ortiz. All right. You know, and... um. Yeah, you can't make mistakes so, on the internet. These everyone else yeah, on the internet right. is perfect. Doesn't it make you well, wonder what does a person get? What do they think they're going to gain when they point out how someone who's uh, in the arena doing shit? Hey, Teddy, you made a mistake. Ha ha. Like, I want to ask that guy, like, hey, what did you get from that? Do you feel better about yourself? Do your friends feel proud of you when you call them and tell them, look it, I caught Teddy slipping. I, I caught him. Like, to go back to your mundane zero life and, and let the men who are out here doing shit continue about their business and stay out of the way. <laughs> That's what you look I like, knew an I, idiot. I knew I, I knew I could, I knew I could, um, you know, explain this to the right person who <laughs> just infuriates me. I just don't know what you get from that. Like, hey, look at I made someone unhappy today. I'm so proud of myself. Cut the shit. Like, be nice to eat someone or just zip it. Well, anyway, I digress. I, yeah, I'm glad. I, well, I shared it with the right guy who's very calm and mundane <laughs> about this. So, so he took a shot at me saying something that because. He blamed it on me watching too much UFC, Ken. And, um, <laughs> Pay attention. I don't know. Pay attention. I, Teddy make Teddy I, pronounces yeah. the names wrong and gets them confused yeah. frequently, like yeah. everyone else. So, I, I in my moment of meanness, I was like, oh, "What's all right?" I made him say, "What's his excuse for all the mistakes that I'm sure he makes during the day?" Right. <laughs> I mean that you know. Thank God we're not aware of them because we wouldn't have time on the podcast. No, we're not. You know why we're not aware of them? Because no one cares about that guy. The guy who's out there trolling other men. No one cares about that guy. That's why he's trolling. Because no one's paying attention to him. Do no, something productive. And we don't care if he's doing it in his grandmother's basement with Hanes underwear or with some <laughs> other brand. I mean, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But um, but. You know, I noticed that none of these guys who like to jump, you know, if I make a mistake or if you make a mistake, but they don't say anything when I might, you know, I might tell them that a fight is going to be knocked out the next round and it actually happens. Or when a fight is winning, like I did, I did Saturday night, um, I told people that Santalan would be the should be the favorite and they put up the live you know the live uh, betting and he was plus 600 big underdog and i was shaking my head like saying i don't get it they're way off they're way off and then the next round went on and what happens it went up even further and i'm like i don't get santion they make a mistake santion should be the favorite um it, it turns out Santion destroys him. So 
he didn't, you know, he didn't make any complaints about that, that I, I was able to get right the most important, I would say, the most important part of my job. Uh, analyzing a fight, breaking a fight, telling folks what's going to happen before it happens. Um, so I had a little something that I thought about people like him. My late great friend Jack Newfield, the great writer, who obviously I miss all my friends that aren't with us anymore, but um, he used to say, he called Don King one time, this is perfect for these people, Ken, he called Don King a vulture on a ring post. And... <laughs> <laughs> I I that's what I call these people now. I prefer buzzard to vulture. All right, buzzard on a ring post <laughs> um, to jump <laughs> to jump on someone where you know when they think it's easy pickings, right? And for what uh, to make themselves, as you said, feel important? Get it? You know, like go get a job. <laughs> Maybe you might actually feel you know a little bit better for you know. For more than the five minutes, this is going to help you. This is this is a short-lived help, um, you know. Or, or start your own podcast and do a better job than than me and Ken, and you know, let us all know, you know, what we're missing. Take our audience, take our audience, and then say, "See, I told you I was better than you guys. I'm going to demonstrate it." These people, do you, listen. You and I together, we don't know one single person that we consider our friends that we consider successful that would ever do such silly nonsense as troll other men look if you disagree with someone you're perfectly within your rights to say i disagree with that and have a a, a professional or a cordial debate you can even vehemently disagree with someone but just to shit on someone and leave a negative comment to say like oh you made a mistake and here's you're talking like something inconsequential like oh i got victor confused with virgil like god forbid everyone knows what the hell i'm talking about it's like pointing out a typo in a tweet congratulations the english professor these people are idiots that do this kind of stuff well, I'm but glad i know I one got thing that out of you i'm glad <laughs> that, i got that out of your system because, I know no, that, that Sam, I had to get that out of his system because it was bothering him. Yes, I'm, it does I'm, bother I'm, me. I yeah. needed to I need to get that out of his system. It wasn't my system, it was his system. Here's the other thing. How many years have we both been alive? How many years have we been doing this podcast and you've been on ESPN? How many times has someone come up to you in person and said, You're an idiot, you made a mistake on a name? I can answer for both of us. Zero. Because if they did they'd probably be picking up their teeth because at a certain point, men don't let other people disrespect them like Thank that God that they will online. Out there. <laughs> Thank God there's more gentlemen out there than there are ungentlemen. 100%. And I know that Bill Crack probably smashed that bookie. Whoever was putting those lines up on the Santione uh, fight when you were giving your opinion, I'm sure if I know anything, Bill Crack was hammering them. Well, no, I wanted to call him. I, I hope he saw it because I wanted to call C Bill Krakenberger, uh, crack, the crack man in Vegas who's a friend of mine, a great handicapper. I, I wanted to call him up and say, jump on this. Jump on it. This is the stuff you live for. I'm sure he did if I know him. That guy doesn't miss a bet. The last thing I'll say before we dive into the fights and we had a bunch of UFC boxing, last thing I'll say is... Um, I'll be leaving tomorrow to go to Saudi Arabia to to cover the uh, to be there for the Nganyu Fury Tyson Fury fight and do some work there for that. You know, I'll be at a dinner the night before with a bunch of great people, special people over there, um, hosted by the the good people over there and hosted by the. Uh, joined by special people are people people like floyd mayweather and lennox lewis and holyfield and many others um i think that's my group that i'm i'm gonna be with but so i it'll be nice to be with those people and those ask floyd uh, when he's coming on the show yeah i will but the thing is the reason i'm mentioning it is i obviously i'll be over there doing a little posting on my social media from there, on their social media a little bit about, you know, for the weigh-in, for the dinner, for the night before the fight, for the fight. I'll be doing all that, but obviously I'll be thinking about our show, and I have no idea 
when I get back, exactly what time I'll be back, what we're going to do on Monday. I, it could be limited to only me being able to cover the Nganyu Fury, which would be a big deal anyway, to cover that. I, I don't know if I'll be able to see anything else. To be, I, I'm sure I won't for the most part. So I might be limited to what I can cover from the weekend, and it might be mostly that. But if it is, it'll, it'll, you know, it'll be uh, a good coverage of it, and um, hopefully it'll be a, something special to cover, to be honest. But then again, we I might surprise you all. I while I'm over there, I might be able to do an interview with Tyson Fury and be able to get that over here to us on a podcast. Or who knows? Maybe I'll give you guys a call at three in the morning. Who knows? I don't know the times over there. And um, I know we're seven hours ahead of you. Maybe give you a call. And maybe somehow we could do the podcast from there. I have no... I'm just throwing all this stuff out there because I'm flying a little bit in the dark on it. Um, all I do know... 100% is I'll be there, and I'll be with my, my son, which is going to make it e even better, obviously. So we'll see what we get. You know, we'll see what we get and what comes of it. At the very least, I'll be back Monday to cover everything that I'm able to cover. And, um, you know, I, I miss you guys. I miss uh, everyone, uh, the fans, but I miss being able to hear anything about people taking, you know, shots at me i miss that you know i miss being able while i'm over there being able to be informed if uh you know somebody is picking on me uh you know but i'm sure i'll get caught up uh, uh like news flash you don't have to wait they're going to be picking on you and taking shots oh, that's what right. they do okay. <laughs> there'll be a hundred comments two of them are going to be negative no matter what well, even if you cure cancer right. if you walk well, on water not. they'll tell you you can't swim hopefully not but look we're ready for it. Um, I, you know, I have a, I have a raincoat. I have a raincoat. Um, I can, I can repel the water. Um, and if those people, are the worst thing that happens in my life, I'm blessed because I got. They're outnumbered. They're outnumbered by all the beautiful people that I do have in my life, and a lot of you guys out there, and the fan base that, um, that want us to do this and allow us to do this um you know continue subscribing please keep pa passing it on getting your friends to subscribe and all that stuff and uh see you guys you know let's do the show and then see you guys next week see what we have maybe we'll we'll have some surprises for you we'll see but in the meantime let's get into the fights where do you want to start? You want to start with the UFC, wherever yeah, you want let, to start. Yeah, let's start with um, UFC, and we'll work our way up from the um, on the main card. Starting that was with, afternoon. Um, it's always nice. You like the afternoon. I love it. The only thing yeah. is, my kids had football games, so trying to negotiate with my wife who's going to cover which game, so I could be home for the UFC, is always a challenge in the middle of the day, but. I like it, especially when there's boxing on uh, in the evening, because I can basically watch sports all day, much to my wife and children's chagrin. But I love it, selfishly. Identify the two champions. I know the one on my right, but identify the two champions that are on your legendary board. I um, just realized you. that I hadn't changed this one out. That's Cameron in between the main and the co-main at UFC Boston. That's the future. That's yep. the future yep. jujitsu kid. Present yep. and future. He's uh, as 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 much as I love watching him do jujitsu and wrestling. He played. I want to say maybe they had seven flag football games and. I, I don't want to sound like a like a jerk and a braggart. I have three. I have three boys. The other two together might have had three touchdowns in the whole season. Cameron had about fifteen touchdowns in seven games. Two or three times, someone actually got the flag from him that he didn't score when he got the ball. It was crazy. They would just start sitting Special him out count. after a while. Oh, he's so he's so. Oh, he's he, next to he's not he's next to you. Got him up on the wall next to the right guy and other special <laughs> talent. So you got him. You definitely got him next to the right guy there. But um, congratulations to all your kids. 
Thank you. Thank you. He's a sweet, sweet kid. He's the nicest of all my kids. He's the most comfortable in his own skin, but he's also the most aggressive. Like, you know, he had, we had some friends over this week. He was playing basketball and he went to drive to the hoop and he, and he, and his, my oldest son accidentally tripped him up. Their feet got tangled and Cameron went down and his head bounced off the, um, brick steps going into our back porch like I was convinced his head was going to be busted open he fell down he cried he went in the house for about three minutes and came right back out he's like all right guys I'm ready and I was like wow I mean I was first concerned he might have like broken his neck and then he might have busted his head open but the kid is just he has toughness that you can't teach you know what I mean where you're just like damn this kid is rugged and I got four kids I know the, the other ones are just like no thanks to all this contact the little one he's man he's just he has gifts that you just hope that he continues to work towards. But I'm lucky. I'm happy. You know, they're all gifted. They all have gifts. They're all different gifts. And That's they're all right. special in their own ways. He's special in that way. That's and, exactly um, right. He got all my. It got all the toughness from my wife, for sure. The other ones are more like me. They know what they're... They know their strengths and weaknesses. Well, but... Um, let's, let's get... Well, you guys have been a good team. You done a good job raising your family together oh, it's a collective you, effort i appreciate no you. doubt about that but let's get to some other special gifted uh athletes that we can talk about with our gifted audience yeah let's talk first about um who probably had the worst night at ufc and that would be the doctor at one point, I forget the two fighters that were fighting, but one of them got kicked directly into the groin and the doctor came in and he's like, what? he said something to the effect of what's the matter? And the fighter said, he got me in the balls. And the doctor's like, nah, he didn't kick you in the balls. And the guy said, excuse my <laughs> language, but he said, he got me in the dick and balls. He got me in the dick and balls. And, and the doctor's like, I don't think so. And even Anik was like, oh my God, this doctor, I mean. It was clear as day that he got hit. And unless this guy was up for an Academy Award, I've never seen someone so hurt from a groin shot. He went down face first. I mean, he, he was clearly hurt. Well, anyway, then the doctor took center stage again in the Johnny Walker versus uh, Ankalaya fight. And, you know, Johnny Walker, I don't know that English is his first language. He might speak English, but he's, he's Brazilian. He speaks Portuguese. And the doctor apparently, and I don't have the exact verbiage but he basically asked him if he knows where he is and i think he said something to the effect he's in the desert but basically he asked him some questions and he didn't like the answers that walker gave although walker didn't look that that uh compromised to me but the doctor basically told the ref wave it off and it was needless to say everyone involved was shocked including johnny walker i mean dana white had to come into the cage to calm everyone down as the two fighters tried to get back at it but uh Man, just a terrible, terrible turn of events there for everyone involved. So sad. But um, what'd you think of that stoppage? You know the old saying, nobody knows other than the person himself and God, right? That, yep. That's the old saying. Yeah, You don't, look, the doctor's trying to do his job. You don't know. Nobody's perfect. You don't know if a guy's really that hurt. You, the main thing is it's confirmed by the videotape he got hit there clean. Okay, you know that. That's a good place to start. Um, you don't know the degree of how he's wearing a protector, a cup. Maybe he got hit underneath it or drove the cup up, whatever. You don't know how badly the man is hurt, the person is hurt, um, no matter what the visual evidence is. Only he really knows. And you, and you have to go by that. You trust that he's that hurt. And, you know, obviously your eyes tell you that it landed in the groin area. That's a good point. You have to, that's a very good point. I think that one gets discounted is the fact that these guys are like, these are professional fighters. If the guy says he got hit and the jury's out, I mean, you give him the benefit of the doubt. If he's a habitual, you know, actor, Maybe that you take that into consideration, but it looked clean to me. It wasn't like he was getting destroyed and then he got hit with a low blow. I mean, they were fighting. He got hit low. I don't know what the doctor thought he was like protecting the other guy from, like hit this guy delaying the fight, but it didn't seem like that scenario was that relevant at the time. No. And again, you don't know. You don't know the legitimacy. Only, like I said, only he and God above know really the legitimacy. You trust that it's real, and you saw that it's it landed there, and you go from there. But as far as Walker and and, and Kalayev, 
Ankalaev was in charge early. He was uh, getting control in Walker against the, you know, against the cage in the first round. And then Ankalaev hit him with a knee while, see, this is really what it's all about. Ankalaev hit him with a knee while he was on the ground, uh, which is a foul. So the Should have been disqualified. Gave, well, If yeah, the guy I mean, can't continue, you have to disqualify him. Well, technically, yes. I mean, but it didn't happen that way. But what happened was he gave him time, which was the right step. He gave Walker time, he being the ref, to recover. And and then what you talked about, the doctor did not like the answers. You know, he's the doctor, we're not. He did not like the answers or non-answers that Walker was giving him while he was observing him in the corner. And... um you know, trying to see if he was concussed, right? Um, so, which is possible, he could have been concussed. If you're concussed, you're obviously you're incoherent. You might not be responding properly. Now, the the language gap, that's a different story. You got to take that into account. You would hope that the doctor would understand when he's asking him general questions, uh, what language he speaks, and he speaks well, and he understands well. You would hope so, because otherwise you could get the wrong answer, even if he's not concussed. But uh, all we can do is deal with what we know, that the doctor was asking him questions, and he didn't feel he got the right answers, and the doctor stopped it. Now, Walker got, as you said, very actively upset, pushing the ref, wanting to continue, he probably, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to be a wise guy, but he probably should have been that aggressive um, or adamant when the doctor was trying to get answers. You know, I mean, he's obviously, unless, again, unless there was a language gap, he wasn't answering them. So he got very aggressive later. As a fighter, you have to be aware. If they ask you if you can see yeah, how many 100%. fingers, the minute you say, I can't see, oh, fight's over. Well, the minute well, you, you know give a wrong over. answer, right. you have to know and that some, those questions listen, are important. There are fighters that play that. There are fighters that know if I hesitate about saying, I, or say, I, I, I can't see, or it's blurry, they know that they're gonna, they're basically stopping the fight on themselves. They know exactly. That. It's not. It's, that's that's it's my so, point. Is well, when they're asking no, you those no, questions, that's you have to focus. Listen, unless you focus on getting out of there, you exactly. don't know. Yep. You just don't know, and we that's don't know right. anything. Anything, as far as I know, Walker was trying to fight, and and um, and I'm gonna go with that. But the doctor was trying to get the answers. Like I said, when he was asking him, maybe Walker could have been a more animated dad. Like yes, saying, completely yeah, agree. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, I'm okay. Or, you know, because even if you don't understand the language, he kind of understands the universal language of what the doctor is going to be asking. <laughs> are you okay? Exactly. Yeah, you know, where are you? What's your ask, name? He's not asking him, where do you want to go to dinner in a couple <laughs> hours, right? He, he's not asking him that. Do you prefer Italian or, you know, continental um, cuisine? He knows that. The other thing, Teddy, he could have been thinking as a fighter, and uh, we've seen people do this when it's so clearly a foul, a knee to the down, a knee to the head of a downed opponent. He could have been thinking, well, if they wave it off, they're going to disqualify this guy. He clearly fouled me. There's no gray area. You foul someone to the point where they can't continue. The fight's over. I mean, if you stomped his head when he's down, like, yeah, you're going to get disqualified. So maybe. As a possibility, and I'm not suggesting this is what happened, but maybe Walker figured out, if I can't continue, I'm going to win this fight on a DQ. No contest would seem, doesn't seem to make sense if, in fact, he was hit with an illegal knee. I just don't understand it, but, you know, and I'll leave it to the pundits on all the uh, MMA media to debate that, but it seems very um, sketchy that that's not a disqualification. But maybe I'm missing something. No, listen, you're covering all bases, possibility. We don't know. We're, we're just trying to cover everything that's possible. <laughs> in the meantime, the, all we do know is Dana White came in the cage. He calmed Walker down. Um, I'm going to guess he probably told him that it's going to be ruled a no contest and they would do it again in the future, run it back. Um, you know, I, I kind of saw Dana do this with his hands at one point, like almost like we're going to run it back. We're going to run yeah. it back. So I'm, I'm sure Dana, 
you know, obviously he's the head man and he's got to be thinking quick, and he does. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was somewhere along those lines. The bottom line is he calmed down. It was rude and no contest. And, and again, I'll finish. There's nothing else to say. Otherwise, I'll finish with what you started with, that Ankoliev was lucky that he wasn't disqualified. Um, you know, since technically... As, well, technically, probably should have been. Um, you know, I don't want to see anybody disqualified if they didn't mean to do something wrong. I mean, that he, he did it not realizing that the guy was fully down. That happens. It, he's a fighter. It happens. But he probably should have been. Um, you know, because what he did was illegal, was a foul. And obviously, as it turned out, Walker couldn't continue. But it's probably going to be in our future. I would think that that fight will probably be there to to rerun again. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, that would make sense. And now there's a little more drama. Now you've got something to really talk about. Um, <clears throat> let's move on to the co-main. Uh, Kamaru Usman takes a sh- last-minute fight or short-notice fight against Shamayev. Um I mean, Shamayev, it's hard enough finding an opponent for him to find a short-notice opponent. Credit to um, Usman. Although Usman, to his credit, he's coming up and fighting in a new weight class for the first time, 185 from 170, where he was the champ for a long time. And on 10 days' notice, wow. 10 10 days' notice. Um, with you know the first round, obviously, Shamayev wisely came out, jumped on him quick. Uh, but man, did Usman turn it around in the second and third. You could make the case that he won both of those rounds. I mean, they were close. But credit to Usman. Like I, when I when they first announced it, I think I texted to you you guys like, oh man, they're feeding Usman to the wolves, making him move up in weight, fighting a guy no one wants. And I was and no disrespect to Usman, because I was shocked by the way he turned it around, especially after getting dominated in the first round, to be able to turn it around, come back out, fight with composure. I think with the full fight camp he wins that fight because he only needed a little bit more a little bit more uh, in the tank in the second and third to like maybe not finish him but look a little bit better and maybe prevent a 10-8 in the first and he's the winner I mean all credit to Usman but Shemaev's a killer too I mean the guy is unbelievable his pace is so frenetic at the beginning so frantic at the beginning of the fight um I loved it I thought this was the most entertaining fight of the night what'd you think well everything you said obviously I agree with because I tweeted it verbatim. I mean, that's that's how I covered it. That's exactly right. Look, um, great credit to Usman and to Volkanovski for taking these fights, saving the show on quick notice. Uh, the first thing, because of the result of what happened, Usman might have lost the fight, but uh, in in the end, he won. Stock uh, went up. It's one of those, yeah, stock went way up, way up. And it's one of those rare, you know, it happens, but those rare situations where someone loses, but they win in losing in different ways. In the way that he did, uh, he was forgotten about for the most part after his two straight losses uh, to Edwards. He was written off. People forgot that before that he was the GOAT of the welterweight or considered the GOAT. Of the welterweight division? The first fight when he lost to Edwards, he was beating the brakes off him for the whole fight and then got caught with yeah. like a couple minutes or Last two to round. go. Yeah. yeah. So A blind kick beautifully set up by Edwards, but yeah. And then he lost a decision in a rematch yep. um, with no confidence builder in between to get back mentally to the right place. But look, again, we forget so how fast we forget. People forgot that he was considered the greatest welterweight of all time already that's right um and 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 then he was written off and now he's back he's back and and look god bless him he he took a risk a big risk and it paid off um again he takes a fight on 10 days notice versus a monster as you said loses the first round 10-8 i think pretty much on all cards i believe that's right uh, that's right Shem- shemayev takes him to the floor Tried to submit him. Usman did a tremendous job surviving. And while I thought that Usman's gas tank might be, and I, I tweeted it, the might be empty, you know, just surviving that round. Uh, and, and by the way, 
to, in surviving, he showed how physically unbelievably strong, even as a smaller man, he is where he picked up Shemaev with him wrapped around his back. It was really unbelievable. Shemaev was wrapped around his back trying to submit him with his legs locked around him. And he stands up and stands up with him on his back. So it showed you how strong this man is, which he was always known as being so physically strong. Um, but just really incredible. But the crazy, the incredible thing was that you would have thought that he would have used up his gas tank surviving that round. Instead, it was actually Shemaev who seemed gas because in the second round where, you know, I thought that Shemaev, and I tweeted it, I, I, I thought that Shemaev would probably attack after the first round. He didn't. And obviously, looking back now, he in hindsight, he didn't because he was gassed. And yep. he allowed Usman to be left alone in the second round where he didn't have to expend any energy, allowed him to strike, Usman that is, where Usman did really well, having an edge until the end round of the round when Shemayev had a quick takedown. So it was a very close round, like you said, Ken, um, very close round. Then the third round, another close round where for most of it, or much of it, Usman was able to strike, and and he had the edge striking. Uh, Shemayev had the edge on the mat, I, I think it's fair to say, but Usman had the edge striking, very close round. I, I think I gave it to Usman, but I'll tell you, uh, to repeat what you said, to echo what you said, if Shemayev doesn't have that 10-8 first round, he might have lost. Um, which is extraordinary. We never thought we'd be saying that before the fight. Uh, as I said at the beginning, this was a victory for him coming in here with low expectations, obviously him being Usman, on him having taken it on short notice. And like I said, he lost his two fights where, you know, he, he he's coming off two straight losses to Edwards. Uh, everyone forgot so fast, you know, how special he was. He was written off, and this brings him back. You know, his 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 stock just uh, shot way up uh, after it had been so low that in your world you would understand this terminology. People were actually shorting the stock, right? So it's once again a blue ribbon, a blue ribbon uh, stock, and it, it shows us, it reminds us how fast things can change in life, uh, for good or bad. I mean, just how, just bang, how quick things can can change around. That's why you should never get the two down and give up or get too disenchanted or too discouraged or too depressed with things going bad because like that, things can turn. They can turn. You can turn them. You can turn them. You can turn them. And Usman showed that. He took the... He, Took the gamble on himself. Everyone else stopped believing him except for one guy, the most important guy, him, Usman, the main man in the arena. What does he do? He, um, you know, he 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 gets he gets back to where people once again are going to be looking at him as uh, the special fighter he is. And he's going to get a, you know, he'll wind up getting probably a a, a title fight or or something close to it. Um, I'm sure another big fight. Um, I was glad to see that. Um, I really was. Uh, I liked the way that after the fight, Shemayev truly spoke like a champion, you know, calling for the fighting in the Middle East to stop and for the killing to end and how he didn't even feel right. You know, it was really pretty extraordinary that... Uh, and I didn't think he was making an excuse for a lesser performance than maybe people expected from I I put it more on Usman being special that that what happened happened, uh, which was unexpected for for Shemayev to even be in a competitive fight, uh, considering the circumstances. So I didn't think it was an excuse. It was just I thought it was sincere that that he said that it didn't feel right fighting because of what's going on and how people, people, all people are treating each other. Um, 
you know, so for me, we always knew he could fight like a champion. Um, he can also behave like one. And I noticed there were even some boos because he didn't favor one side. Um, when he, he, he just said, I just don't want people basically killing each other. People. People. And um, he wanted the fighting to stop. So um, I, I just thought that he he spoke. It was spoken as a champion, and and a, just a good person, and that leads us to the uh, to another fight. That really, the funny thing was, everyone thought that the Shemayev um, Usman fight would be a mismatch, as you said honestly. That you even tweeted that feeding Usman to the Lions, right? And yep. um, and people were like, well. This one is going to be rough too, but because Volkanovski was a rematch, had fought him already, and it was close, and it was competitive. Some people even thought Volkanovski could have got it. I thought uh, Makachev had won the first, very close, but I thought he had won it. But Volkanovski, you got to love him. You got to love him. It's hard to go against him. And you figured that, okay, He's so special that even though he's taking it on short notice, he's the smaller man that you never know. You can't count out Volkanovski. But we were counting out Usman. We were saying that's, that's right. going to be a mismatch. And it turns out that's a competitive fight. And the Volkanovski uh, Makachev turns out to be a mismatch. So I, I thought that the key takeaway in that fight for me was Volk's comments after the fight that he had to take, he wanted to take a fight to stay busy and stay in camp. It sounded to me like he might be wrestling with some mental health issues, which I hope he's not, but that's certainly what he indicated. He got choked up during the post-fight press conference good point. saying that, you know, he's got to stay busy, wants to stay busy. I mean, even after getting knocked out in the, um, or technically knocked out in the fight, as soon as they interviewed him, first thing he said was, please keep me busy. I want to be back in in January, which seems unlikely coming off a TKO loss like that, where he got, you know, and buzzed he was busted and up compromised. Too. Yeah badly bu busted up but um yeah with regards to the fight you know looked like it was going to be a, a strategic feeling out round first round uh Makachev was throwing low kicks low kicks and then came right upstairs and got right over the glove of uh right over the right hand of um Volk and clipped him on the eyebrow obviously busted his head open put him on Queer Street and Makachev with a guy like that who's considered probably the pound for pound at this point best fighter in the world he jumped on him immediately and closed the show just perfect finisher tough loss for Volk but I thought you know like you I thought Volk's gonna have a good show here he's got nothing to lose he's still the champ it's very rare where you can go in and have a fight lose and still be the champion so he goes back down to 45 where he's the reigning champion and uh, it'll be interesting to see how he uh, continues to campaign down there I've never seen Volk seem vulnerable uh emotionally or from a mental health standpoint as he appeared to be after this fight and i hope he's okay and if he's watching uh please know that alex the, anything you're going through is nothing unique a lot of people struggle with this stuff hopefully he gets to talk to someone that can um keep him grounded keep him focused and like he said he's got a beautiful family and lots of things to be happy about and uh hope he's okay emotionally and uh physically but how'd you like it while it lasted yeah, I felt I felt bad for Volkanovski as you know as you sort of uh, expressed, and uh, I mean Makachev is special, but I just felt bad for Volkanovski. Obviously, he used his easy, uh, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty. Obviously, you could say he used poor judgment, taking his fight on short notice with you know this beast when he knew he was in a top shape. Because you could see his body was softer than that. Yeah, um, that's a good point. You know, I noticed yeah. that too. So, yeah, so that's the first thing that, especially my eyes are going to catch, and where my mind's going to go. Of course, he got paid big money to do it, but in the end, I would say that it probably wasn't worth it. But I don't know. Um, it's not me. Um, but he's such a proud guy. He's probably feeling that it's not worth it. But he did what he had to do. What he made a choice to do and what he believed he could do. And um, at the end of the day, Shemaev was just too big, strong, and also fast and explosive. 
You know, I want to cover all the all, all those areas of talent because they all were on display. Uh, even early, when Volkanovski was against the cage, Ken, with him, you could you could see, and, you know, Volkanovski was trying to navigate position and, and, you know, wrestle position and negotiate position there, but you could see that Shemayev was was just so strong and in control, even though it wasn't as obvious it, as it was going to become, but you could still see that he was in control. And that kick that you talked about was so, so fast and explosive with with the shin bone hitting Volkanovski on the temple, um, a terrible place to get hit, just destroying his equilibrium, dropping him, and then you could see Volkanovski, the special man he is, he still was trying to stay conscious, and and he was, but obviously he was so badly compromised, and uh, you know Shemayev immediately did what great fighters do. He he knew how to finish. You know he he just jumped right on him and finished him. Um, but the kick was also. As you alluded to, it was well set up. It wasn't just a lucky kick. I mean, it was well set up with other kicks that had a meaning to them earlier that were maybe throwaway kicks, but to get him thinking they were going to come low and then later on the one high he wouldn't expect it. That's just what he did. You know, he threw him at different levels uh, to make Volkanovski think they'd continue to come from those levels, and um, and then he just exploded upstairs. He closed that he closed that gap on him, and then exploded the kick in such a devastating, explosive fashion. Wow, it was pure talent. Uh, in the end, Makachev is is um, is obviously. Uh, I'm saying the right names. I get confused between these names, but uh, yeah, Makachev is special. Uh, you know, is special. And and that was the risk of taking a fight at this level with somebody that special on quick notice. You know, I mean, you could get away with it, you know, with certain guys, but when you're when it's that higher level of talent, uh, it's this can be the result, and uh, obviously it was. But we love Volkanovski. We we salute Makachev for the talent that he is, but we love Volkanovski for the person he is, the fighter he is, the man he is, everything. Uh, I don't know Makachev as well the way I do Volkanovski, who's been on our show, right? He was uh, on yep. our show in That's um, right. a couple uh, year and a half ago, whatever it was. And um, I just know that he's, you know, he's a special man. You felt for him. You, you can see the pride that, you know, and no, no excuses. He wasn't trying to be get sympathy. I mean, he, he knew he made the choice to do this. And, uh, you know, he just said, it, I, I'm competitive, it hurts, but, um, you know, I, I'll be back and he will. And as you touched on, I think getting back in January might be a little too fast. I think he might need more time than that. First of all, you got to heal up the cut, which was pretty bad. So uh, I, I would think, but they'll figure it out. But again, uh, knowing Volkanovski is the just as a special person that he is. Um, it's, you, you hate to see, you know, you, you hate to see anyone competitive beaten that kind of way. Uh, you know, it's part of the business. I understand. But you hate to see someone who you happen to know goes beyond the talent, beyond the pure talent, that they're purely also got the character of a good human being uh, you know you feel you feel it but he'll be back uh he'll be back because he's special the other guy it's gonna be interesting to to see who who does he fight next you know who who does he fight next you have i haven't given any thought to it but um who does he fight next who do we want to see him fight next 
You know, when you have a talent like that and a guy that's mentally so zoned in to believing in himself, I find myself wanting to see him test it all the time. Like, let's see, if, can he, what can he do with this guy? You know what I mean? What can he do with this guy? What can he do with that style? You know, so I'm, I'm curious to see what's next for that, you know, obviously extraordinary talent. Yeah, it should be interesting. But before we jump into the boxing, let's take a quick minute to give a shout out to our number one sponsors, Athletic Greens. Go to Athletic Greens. I'm taking God. that to I'm taking that over to Saudi Arabia yeah, with me, be. by the way. Yeah, well, I got my package. I got I don't have as much as you have because, you know, <laughs> um you're you're the you're becoming a man. But I I, I can always borrow some from you, can I? Of Can course, I? of course. Yeah, uh, the uh, the one nice thing about the offer that they're giving to our listeners at athleticgreens.com slash atlas, they'll send you 10 free travel packs with your first purchase, and the travel packs are uh, ever-present with me wherever I go. I never travel without them. It's the truth, especially when you're traveling, your immune system can get run down. And of all the supplements that I take, Athletic Greens is honestly the number one uh, priority for me every single day. Take a scoop, mix it up with some water in the morning every single day, and you get 75 whole food sourced ingredients. So all the vitamin miner- all the vitamins and minerals are derived directly from whole food source ingredients. So you can't go wrong there. It's the cleanest supplement probably on the market. Athleticgreens.com slash Atlas. Take advantage of the 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Athletic Greens, I honestly, we love this stuff. We approach them. We ask them to come and sponsor the show because we were fans of the product. They're customers. So check them out at athleticgreens.com. Let's talk boxing, Teddy. Jack Catterall back in action. The slick 140-pound southpaw was in, in action against that super tough Jorge Linares. You always know what you're getting with Linares. And, Linares uh, is getting a little old. He's getting a little old. That's, yep. that's, 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 let's put that out there. But, sure. yeah, he's a solid you know, solid pro, you know, solid pro that's was in great shape. You could see physically Lenovis was in great shape. Yeah. Um, you know, Always for is. a 38-year-old guy or for any age. Scorecards, 117, 111, and 116, 112. I was on surprised. I thought they were they could have been farther apart. I'll be honest. Agreed. Usually Agreed. I'm the opposite. I'm saying, oh, man, these stupid judges once again, you know, they they got it closer than it belongs uh this should have been further out than it, i thought yeah, but yeah i agree cutter controlled the fight all night one easy i was surprised that as i said the scores were as close as they were but from the beginning it was the straight right hand of lenaris who, who one time dropped Lo- the great lomachenko lomachenko got up and stopped him um shows you how great lomachenko is um, and has been, but from the beginning, it, it was really the strength of Linares, that straight right hand that he has power in, that he was trying to land against the southpaw, because the right hand could be the southpaw killer, as I coined that phrase years ago, calling the fights on ESPN. Uh, he, it, it, it really was evident from the beginning that was the strategy. Uh, it would be Linares's right hand versus the southpaw counterpunching of Catterall. And Catterall just did a great job all night, consistent of controlling the range with his jab. Then he either counted you or he, he would get off first with leads when Linares waited a little too long in front. Uh, a lot of people are going to say Linares didn't punch enough. He didn't. Uh, he was hesitant to move his hands, I thought, because he was worried about being counted, to be honest. That's what happens when you're in there with a counter puncher. You miss, you get hit back. Sometimes you get a little bit tentative to throw because that's going to happen. And you're going to miss, and you're going to get hit. So, And he didn't have the answers, obviously, in his corner or whatever to make the adjustment he needed to maybe make um, in that kind of situation. There's always an adjustment to make. But Linares used, a, I thought, a lot of wasted movement where he was moving his head and posturing in front from a little too far out. But obviously, again, 
not punching. And he just... Well, he, he he just wasn't nearly busy enough. Uh, again, credit to Catterall, who, you know, has a good defense. If you're going to be a counterpuncher, you have to be like Floyd Mayweather. You have to have good timing, good hand speed, and um, good defense. And Catterall has all of that. He, he'd make a miss, counter, so he got Linares a little, you know, a little timid, Afraid to let his hands go too much, I guess. Catero was, he, what he's not is he's not a power puncher. But he's short on power, but not on brains and technique. He, he's a smart, solid boxer, counter puncher. Just really can, he's, he's a pure counter puncher. I mean, that's, that's, that's how he makes his living. The only thing that I saw where you could, and I I tweeted this, where you could catch him. Too bad they don't allow phones in a corner where maybe he would have saw my tweet, but <laughs> it could have helped him. Although I saw a phone in a corner once, which, again, still, still makes me shake my head uh, not too long ago, um, where... I was up on a ring apron talking to somebody. And it wasn't just for one round. It was for a few rounds. I don't know. It was a little... I was wondering what was going on with the commission, uh, thinking that that would be okay. But the only thing that I really saw where you could catch him, if you noticed as I did, but obviously the novice people didn't notice it, was Catterall slips his head, moves his head to his left side, Ken, 95% 95% of the time. So, I mean, you have to take advantage of that information. You know, you gotta. if I'm in a corner, you got to faint him to get him to move to that side, knowing that that's where he's going to move when he thinks a punch is coming. And then you shoot, you know, you time the right hand to that side and you and you catch him. You, you just have to notice these things. Um you got to notice things like that when you're in there with a slick, smart boxer like that. Uh, the other thing is, I think Linares, part of his problem is he shorts his jab a lot. A lot of his jabs just fall short because he doesn't really, he's drawn them from too far and he's not really trying to land. He doesn't always, sometimes he's just trying to keep the guy off him, trying to kind of get a distance with it but he doesn't get full extension on a lot of his jabs Uh, when he does get full extension in spots it's a good jab but there were too many jabs I was recognizing from Linares that would just you know like I said he was shorting them He, he wasn't getting full extension on them at the end of the day uh nice Nice boxing exhibition by Catterall. You know, really showed you what the sweet science is about. Uh, beautifully done. Just beautifully done. Yeah, great job by uh, Catterall. I'll be curious to see what he gets next if he gets the Josh Taylor uh, rematch that he's calling for. But in the um, next fight I wanted to talk about is Giovanni Santian destroys Alexis Roca in six rounds, knocks him down twice in the fifth, closes it out in the sixth. This fight on paper looked really close. I think Santillon was a decent underdog here, actually, and uh, man, did they have that one wrong. This was an absolute beatdown. Uh, man, the kid looked good, so solid, in the pocket all night, just throwing beautiful combinations with authority. How'd you like it? Yeah, two fighters on the card, on this particular card, card on the zone, caught my eye and really impressed me. Doesn't happen a lot, but when it happens, I want to give them their, their, you know, their just dues. Really impressed me very much. It was John Ramirez, and who we'll talk about in a minute, and it was also Sant- Santillan. Uh, Santillan. Santillan. Am I pronouncing it right? Santillan? Santillan, um, I believe. Santillan. 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 Uh, listen, either way, he can fight. Uh, it was very strange for me, as I said earlier, 
because I'm watching it, and they just kept posting the betting odds. They have Roca a 600 minus 600 favorite, Santalan plus 400, and then after the first round, I like Santalan even more, and I'm convinced he's gonna win this fight. You know, maybe easily, and then after the second round. They post Roca at like minus a thousand. I mean, don't hold me to it, but I I don't remember exactly. I didn't write it down. But they they post them in the second, third round, whatever. Where I think it's obvious that Sandalon's going to win. They they got Roca going up even higher as a favorite. And I'm like, <laughs> these, are these guys drinking? I'm I I don't know what's going on here. Like, and I really was, as I said earlier, I didn't have time, but I wanted to send a message quick to to my friend Bill, you know, Krakenberger and say, hey, Bill, you, you want to pay for like a year's mortgage um, or a year's rent? Uh, jump on this thing. I, 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 I haven't seen too many opportunities with odds that are this wrong, just wrong, where this is what you look for. This is what handicappers, bettors look for. They look for... You know, they look for chances like this. And um, like I said, I'm shaking my head. Just can't believe it. But uh, for like I said, for like another two rounds, they just kept making Roka a bigger, bigger favorite. Uh, it was it was pretty crazy. Meanwhile, Santalan's the much stronger, better puncher, more accurate. He walked in close to Roka. Uh, he plays clean shots to the body and head, <laughs> and he mixed up his punch as well. He showed he showed me a really good repertoire of different punches. He was he was always balanced in position to get full leverage on his shots. Uh, if I had been commentating that fight, I would have made a lot of people money. Probably you too, Ken, because I know you would have been listening. I, I would have made some fans money out there because I would have I would have told them, you know, I would have said, hey, guys, you know, get on Santalon, you know, while the, before the odds drop because they're gonna drop, they're gonna drop just like Roka's gonna drop. They're gonna, they, I, I don't know what's gonna drop first, the odds are Roka. Uh, I I think that Roka dropped before the odds did. I'm not sure, but um. I definitely would have been telling you good fans out there uh, each round to jump on Santalon. Uh, I I still can't believe that everyone didn't see what I was seeing or what I was tweeting. Anyway, Roka's only chance was on the outside uh, working, but Santalon still got he, he still got the geography he needed. He got in close. Uh, where he wanted to be, and he did huge damage. So, Santalan's a calm. He's he's a calm fighter. He's got good vision. He sees everything. He finds the openings. The welterweight division. You know, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, is loaded. I I would love to see the two young undefeated. Contenders there meet Santalana and Virgil. Virgil, not Victor. <laughs> Ortiz. I think he's still a welterweight. I don't know. He's a young kid. They both up, but I know Virgil's young. He's growing. I don't know if he's moving up to junior middleweight. I, I give full disclosure. I'm not I think he's still at welter. If he is, I, I'd love to see that fight. At the end of the day, this was a Golden Boy show. And De La Hoya has started working with Aram, who used to, you know, they hated each other, and Aram, um, he's working with Aram and Top Frank again, and I think anyone knows that in anything in boxing that Aram hated him, uh, and that now they're back together working as, you know, they need to do, I guess, and uh, Roka was, Roka was signed and contracted to Golden Boy, and Santalan was with top rank. Uh, at the end of the day, De La Hoya made a very big mistake taking this fight. They did. I don't think they properly evaluated Santalan's talent, and I think they 
they probably overvalued Roker. Um, either way, it was. I thought it was a big. It was a big mistake. Uh, Aram and top ranks matchmakers basically played the lawyers team. They they obviously uh, they got the better. They got the better of it. But there were also uh, another fight. You want to go into it, Ken? The one that I also mentioned that I really, I was really impressed on that card with this uh, Ramirez. Yeah, you're talking about the um, uh, Ramirez. Yeah, rocks and drops. Uh, Ronald to, uh, Batista, Johnny, Scrappy Ramirez. Uh, yeah, battered I was very Batista. Impressed. Dropped him twice in the fourth. Uh, and just finishes him. Um, yeah, for sure. How, what would you think? How'd you like it? I know you like that kid, Ramirez. I'm glad I saw it. I'm glad I, I watched all these fights. <laughs> because, as I said, really impressed by Ramirez. And and as I said, Santalan too. But different styles. Ramirez, a lot of people are going to be shocked to hear this. But they forgot how good this guy was when he first came up. And how impressive he was, his talent. And his style, his style was different. And who am I talking about? Ramirez, undefeated. He reminded me of a young Adrian Broner when he first hit the scene. I can't believe no one else sees this similarity, really. Because, again, if I'm commentating, that's the first thing I'm going to say. Wow. When Broner hit the scene, tremendous talent and... He his he was a little different, the, his approach and uh, same style with Ramirez, same style, quick hands, covers up really well, walks in, punches very accurately, placing short shots in the pocket, punching in between punches, slipping just enough, just enough. You know, got caught a couple, but slipping very confident. You can't fight this style if you're not supremely confident in yourself. Slipping the shots just a little bit, just a few inches, just enough to make a miss, and then placing his shots in return. Uh, he's very calm in the pocket. He's got very good eyes. Again, just placing shots very well. Steps with you when you try to get away from him. Uh, he stays right with you, like he's glued to you. Doesn't let you get space where you could maybe get full extension and catch him something. He he keeps it tight. He threads the needle with pinpointed shots, and he breaks you down physically and mentally with that style and with that pressure. That's that's all I have on him. But that's enough. That's enough. Uh, I want to see him again. I, I want to follow this guy. Really. I I don't know nothing more about him, what kind of human being he is, what kind of anything. All I know is I I liked his style. Yeah, I think I saw Regis Progray tweeting about him. I think they might be friends. But, uh, yeah, good good win for Ramirez. Looked good. The last one I wanted to touch on from the weekend was um, – Isaac Chamberlain, who dominated Mikel Lawal uh, to become the new British and Commonwealth Cruiserweight champion. I know you had a chance to see that when you wanted to touch that. So how'd you like that? What'd you think of Chamberlain? I'll tell you, it was a blue-collar type fight for me. And I'll tell you what I mean. One-sided. It was for the British lightweight title. Uh, I think you just said that. But uh, Chamberlain and Lawal and... Just one-sided. Nothing really fancy, to be honest with you. Chamberlain just outworked him all night in every round. And I was happy for him because at the end, you could see how much it meant to him. That, you know, just see how much it meant to him. And um, how just, you know, how happy he was. And he put in all this work and it paid off. And like I said, he's not tremendously talented in one area. He's just a good blue collar type guy and that's how he won it was he just outworked Lawal all night in every round except the 12th maybe except the 12th where I think Lawal I gave it to him but nothing as I said complicated nothing fancy 
Lawal just didn't punch enough and really honestly didn't try hard enough or it didn't appear that he tried hard enough. He just looked for big right hands. Maybe, maybe I'm not giving Chamberlain enough credit. He didn't let him try hard enough. He just stayed on him. Um, he reduced Lawal to looking just for right hands in spots, but Lawal didn't have any consistent offense to come close to answering what Chamberlain, you know, brought, you know, brought to the table. Uh, and at the end of the day, the way that I would have said it if I was calling the fights, and I, it's the way I would always say these type fights, Chamberlain fought to win while Lawal fought not to lose. That was, that was, that's what it was for me. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, all right, before we get into the preview of uh, Nganu Fury, was there anything else that we missed from the weekend that you wanted to touch on? No, I, I, I there was, uh, I think there was a couple of uh, fights <coughs> down the street that I wanted to uh, talk about that couple of fracases I saw as I was driving <laughs> my car and people. But other than that, uh, I, I think we'll leave that off. Uh, hopefully there'll be less of that um, extracurricular stuff going on. And like I said, hopefully we'll get more, we'll get more people caring about each other uh, and not, uh, you know, throwing punches other than inside the octagon or the squared circle. But no, I think that uh, we can go to this event that I'm going to be out there you know, watching in in person uh, in a few days. Um, well, let's jump into that then. The uh, the preview for our friends over at My Bookie. If you're gonna bet on this fight, please go to mybookie.ag and use the promo code Atlas for a fifty percent credit on your first deposit. Teddy, regarding the fight, what do we need to look for in this? What does each guy have to do to win? Give us the breakdown. Obviously, Fury's supposed to play with him, right? It's a yep. it's a money grab. It's an event, right? No doubt about it. And Fury is a world champion, heavyweight champion of the world. He's been fighting his whole life, boxing his whole life, uh, amateur, pro, you know. And he's a huge man. And Ganyu's a big, big man too. But Fury's even bigger. <laughs> And it's supposed to be a no-brainer that, you know, it's the same way as McGregor and, uh, McGregor and Mayweather was supposed to be. I covered that fight, too, uh, at ringside with, uh, with the great Charles Sonnen and the great Charlie Monahan, um, who does all the UFC uh, fights as a director. So it's supposed to be like that. That didn't turn out. McGregor and Mayweather didn't turn out to be as one-sided as people thought because after five rounds, I actually had Mayweather. I mean, I actually had McGregor winning. And Mayweather's, you know, uh, is one of, I mean, he's a great fighter and I've always seen him as the way he should be seen, a great fighter, great defensive fighter, great counter-puncher but a guy who has a little bit more than just that. You know, when he's got to step it up, he steps it up. When he's got to go get you, he goes get you. And he's still going to get you. But at, 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 at a later age now in his life. But I... That fight turned out to be more compelling than people thought it would be because McGregor... Style. Styles make fights. McGregor was a great counterpuncher. Even though he's not a boxer, in his striking career in UFC, he could punch. He had power. He was a southpaw. Southpaw is always different to, to deal with and to prepare for. And he had long arms. And he was able to stay on the outside and actually use his jab and keep the great counterpunch of Floyd from counterpunching. So the style was a problem for Floyd for five rounds. Then he figured it out. But he was able to keep him on the outside and not allow Floyd to do what he does, counterpunch. And 
then Floyd had to make an adjustment, which he did. The special ones do. He he had to start to do what he doesn't normally do: press the fight, be aggressive, go Mike Tyson on him. And you know, you know if just to get your attention, I use that terminology. But come forward, slip the shots, get in, and apply pressure and break down McGregor. He had to do that. And it took him eight rounds to do that because that's not his forte. But he did it, and he got to him. But again, the fight was better than people thought it was going to be. They thought it was going to be a whitewash right from the beginning, and it wasn't. This fight, I don't know, but it's the same... It's the same pre-fight thinking as the Mayweather-McGregor. You know, crossover fight, MMA, UFC, going to boxing. You, they can't win unless they use UFC rules. It's almost not fair because they, they know how to wrestle, they know how to grapple, jiu-jitsu, throw kicks, elbows, and they're not allowed to use any of that arsenal, which is really what makes them king in their sport and it's what they prosper with you know it's the striking but it's all the other elements those elements all taken away from them you can only strike and again when that's the conditions there should be only one winner the boxer because he's been boxing his whole life and at this level a high level so i'm here to say yeah it might be one-sided it might turn out that way, just like the McGregor Mayweather could have turned out that way. I'm not so sure. Only because in Ganyu, I've been in the ring with him. You know, the tape is out there. It's got millions of views. You were there with me in Vegas. He had asked me to train him for one day, and I obliged him. I was in Vegas, and I went to his gym. And I trained him for one day. I saw firsthand not only his power, which anyone could see and feel it up close, but I saw his athleticism. And I saw that he's smart and he picks up things. And he did. In a little short period, he, I showed him a few things, he started picking them up. And I saw the advancements he made in striking in the steepy, steepy fight. Sipe fight when he won his title, when when he won his UFC heavyweight belt against a, at the time the greatest heavyweight of all time, Sipe, who's who's still fighting. He's going to fight now the greatest UFC fighter or the greatest MMA fighter. Period. John Jones, the goat. He's going to be fighting him soon, coming up in November. I'm going to be at that fight in, in at the Garden, covering it for ESPN. But Sipe, when he fought, when when Nganyu fought Sipe, you could see Nganyu, well, first of all, he had to be better, not just strong, but better to beat Sipe. And he was better. He was improved. He got better. So it shows you that he learns. He in, he invo- he evolves. He he picks up things. He adds to his repertoire. <laughs> He's coachable. Okay. He's because he's and he's a big guy, not as big as Fury, but he's big because he's that athletic, that smart. From what I witnessed, at least, that able to learn on the to 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 learn you know on a job if you will to improve to get what he needs to get i'm going to say that it could be again it could be just lights out for fury but it could be interest but here's the thing with the could that goes with the could he has the power to hurt anyone, including Fury, who has an unbelievable chin. He's been he's been dropped by the biggest puncher in boxing, Wilder, a few times, and he's gotten up every time. So he's gotten a he's got a great chin and a great constitution, a great heart. Does Fury great? 
Just great. You got to applaud him for that. Um, and Ganyu has shown, I think, a stout toughness to himself also uh, when he's been tested, where, you know, he's uh, been on the floor being threatened to be submitted and he hasn't. Uh, that that shows a resolve right there that you can you can keep the devil from the door and not give in to compromising yourself to to submitting uh, in any degree. So a lot of stuff that's interesting there. If he can, no matter how much power he has. And Ganyu, it means diddly squat if he can't get it to the chin or the body, obviously, of Fury. If he can't land on a target, it means nothing. Nothing. He has to have, as I always talk about, a delivery system to get. That's the See, that's going to be the key. Has he developed that delivery system in the time from the fight being announced to now? And for me, the delivery system would start with the jab. Has he worked on the jab enough to do two things? One, to set up his power with the right hand or whatever he wants to land to get to the target, to chin it, say, of Fury. But the other is to stabilize Fury where he don't dominate him on the outside with Fury's. He doesn't get dominated with Fury's best punch, the jab. And where Fury's going to use that jab because he's tall, he's long, he should use that jab. And he doesn't allow Fury to control the whole fight on the outside with that jab. So he needs the jab for two reasons. One, to have a chance to land the power. And two, to just keep Fury from controlling him all night. In other words, to... Take away Fury's jab a little bit, a little bit. He doesn't have to 100% take it away, but to nullify Fury's jab at least to a degree where he's not dominated by Fury's best punch. If he gets dominated by Fury's best punch, the jab, and doesn't have an answer for that, then he's going to get destroyed in Ganyu. Destroyed. Because there'll be a matter of time before Fury drops the right hand on him or something else on him off of the jab if he's controlling the range with the jab. So that 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 is tantamount. That is that is the first priority. The jab. To set up your power and to keep Fury from controlling you all night with his best punch. The other thing is, if I was had been training him, I would have been teaching him some tricks because he's an underdog he's going to need a trick he's going to need some trick to pull off an upset what do I mean by trick some kind of disguise something that I teach with fighters we you know we teach with fighters where you can catch a guy because you make the guy think something else is going to happen, and then this happens. Maybe you slip to your left. As you slip to your left, trying to get his eyes to go over looking for a left hook, you shoot a right hand. Maybe you bend low, you throw a right hand to the body, and then you bend low, and then you throw the right hand up top, uh, and you catch him thinking it's going to come. Some kind of trick. You time him. He's jabbing you, time him with a right hand over it. Or maybe you slip parallel with the jab. As he's throwing the jab at you, you slip slightly to your left, parallel, with, and you you shoot, you know, as I talk about, uh, it's like riding the rails. I call it riding the rails. You shoot the right hand right down a uh, parallel with the jab of the guy that's throwing it at you, and, and you ride the rails right to the chin. There's got to be a trick, something. Now, that's up to him and his trainer. His trainer, from all we've understood, is Mike Tyson. Hey, Tyson might have done a great job with him. He's never trained anyone before, but that doesn't mean that he couldn't do a great job with him out of the box. Maybe he did. Um, if he did, you know how Tyson's going to approach it. He's going to approach it with, 
you know, the peekaboo style, slipping shots, trying to get close to the shorter guy. That makes some sense. You know, you want to get close to the shorter guy, you slip the shots, you get in close, and you got a better chance to land something. Um, maybe you, maybe he's even working on a Tyson uppercut where you bang the body inside, you explode that uppercut, which Tyson knocked out a lot of guys with. It was devastating. We're going to find out. The only problem with that, he better be careful. If he's moving that head from too far away and Fury's controlling the range the way he should control the range, he might be vulnerable to getting pot-shotted with an uppercut before he ever gets close. And Fury throws a good uppercut, a, a very good uppercut. You know, he's stopped Dillian White with the uppercut. Uh, you know, a few guys that he's been able to really bring home the bacon, if you will, with that jab and that uppercut. There's another side to that, too. If, if Fury drops his hand, gets a little careless with that uppercut, and, and Ganyu's been taught to slip it and makes it miss, he could count him with a left hook. There could be an opening for that. So some interesting scenarios that I'm giving you here comes down to how serious did Fury take this fight, this event, this moneymaker? How serious was he? Is he in real good? We saw some early pictures. We had his manager on. We saw, you know, some early pictures where he he didn't look he didn't look great. He always he never looks like an Adonis, you know, uh, Fury. He's not his body's not made up that way. He never looks like Hercules. But you know when he's in shape and when he's in better shape and not good shape, he didn't look in good shape. You know, uh, talk about Adonis. Uh, he looked more like, you know, I had said it to his manager straight up, the, the Pillsbury Doughboy in the pictures that we had seen. But he's had a lot of time since then to get in better shape. I haven't seen any pictures of him recently. I'm going to assume he's in the right kind of shape. But the mind, did he take this serious? Or is he taking it in a way that, you know, I'm just going to, again, the way that ninety percent of the people are taking it, that I should dominate, I should, I should have no problem with the guy. If his mindset is that he's overlooking Nganyu, who's a good puncher, who's a good athlete, who's a professional fighter, even though it's not boxing, he understands that domain. He understands how to be calm in an uncalm environment. He understands how to keep the door locked when the devil knocks at it and tries to get you to give in to submit. He understands all that. If he's taken for granted that Nganyu, you know, again, is is just uh, being fed to the lions like, like we talk about sometimes, he could get careless. He could get caught. He could have a surprise. At the end of the day, I, I, I know we're going to get into the, the odds. I, I can't go against Fury, but I'm just saying that don't completely, yeah, Fury should be a big favorite. We're going to find out the odds. I don't even know what they are, but he should be a big favorite, a big favorite. But it's a 10-round fight. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, don't sleep on it. Don't sleep on a guy that there's basically three elements here. And Ganyu can punch. He's an athlete. Four elements. He's 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 in a world of fighting mentally, so he knows how to handle that. And then there's the X factor. Fury. It's all in Fury's hands, really. It really is. The X factor, the fourth element. Did Fury take him too lightly? Not come in physically and mentally prepared and and might get a little careless and get caught something. That, those are the four elements that matter in this fight. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I'm, I'm going with Fury, going with Fury. He's a special guy. You know, as great as, as, great as Nganyu is uh, in his own aspect, in his own right, Fury's, uh, Fury's special. Anybody could get off the floor the way he did against Wilder and, and win the title, keep, and then come back and win the title the second one and destroy Wilder. 
and and fight off the demons that he has in his life of you know alcoholism and drug use and depression and think about suicide and come back from all that that that, that guy's resilient that that guy that guy is it's gonna take you know yeah, you, know, you might have to do a Dracula on that guy. You might have to take a wooden stake and and bang it into his uh, freaking heart to to get rid of a guy like that. I don't well, know for the guy. Well, for the guys at my bookie, and again, if you're gonna bet on the fight, go to mybookie.ag. Use the promo code Atlas for fifty percent credit on your first deposit. The line is minus fourteen hundred on Fury, plus eight hundred on Engano. That's a lot of wood to lay to make a hundred bucks, fourteen hundred. Um, you still like him at those at those odds? I ain't betting that. I ain't <laughs> betting that. I, my my I bookie puts it out there as good as anyone, better than anyone, and they really do. And I, if I did anything, I put I used the terminology of my friend Bill Krakenberger, the handicapper who does this for a living. I, I'll put a peanut. I'll put a peanut play on um, a small play. On, on Engano at plus eight hundred. See, yeah. see if I get you know, for, you know, uh, take a, I'll take a, I'll borrow a hundred dollars from you, Ken, because <laughs> I, you know, and and I'll, I'll put it on. See if I could get back eight hundred. I, I do that. I, I don't want to really go and lay that kind of wood, even though I think Fury's going to win, and he could dominate. Um, I, I'd, I'd look, I look more for. The value of what I'm getting back in this one that I think it's worth a shot, a peanut shot to get, you know, back 800 for 100. I think that's I think that's how I would look at it. Um, the other, the other things I would look at is I, if there was an under over, I'd like to look at that. They don't uh, they don't have it listed yet, but they may they may put it up before the fight starts. But um, let's just say hypothetically, eight and a half rounds, even money. What would you do there? That's you know, if Fury don't take, I got to know if Fury's taking it. And I'm just talking out loud right now as I process this answer. I got to know if Fury took this serious. If he took it serious, you know, because he's a great showman, he's a great promoter. If he took it serious. I got to go with the under. But if he didn't take it serious, everything I laid out there, Ganyu, you know, being a fighter, the mentality, he's got a hard mentality himself. Um, you know, he's he's a proud guy. Uh, you know he's going to be in shape. Maybe Fury's not going to be in top shape. Maybe Fury plays a little bit, kills some rounds. Uh, you know, then, then I would say, hey, I got to give some thought. You know, the... the the, the easier play would be under, but I would give some thought. I give some thought to the over. Here's the prop bet: Will the fight go the distance? No, okay. is minus seven fifty. Yes, is plus four seventy. Ten rounds. Will the fight go the distance? Yeah, see, Are you willing to lay exactly seven hundred and fifty right? to make a hundred right bucks that it doesn't go ten rounds? I figured that. I figured that you obviously had to be laying if you. You know, most people are going to think it's going to go under. So that's the way the bookies of and my bookies figuring. And I again, I play a peanut on the over. That the athleticism, the the X factor of maybe Fury not taking them serious and playing with them a little bit. You know that 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 would allow him to go rounds you know maybe fury waste a few rounds on the outside moving around you know he's very mobile moving around waste a few rounds doesn't really concentrate on on the jab or on offense or on looking to stick it to him uh maybe he kills a few rounds so we you know if you're betting the over you want to you're hoping he kills some rounds and i would take a I, again i take a small bet i guess i don't want to lay that much wood on the obvious, which is that it should go under and that Fury should win. I'm just not willing to lay that much. So I'll take two small plays where they're giving me money. i take a small play on Engano to pull off, you know, an unbelievable, shocking upset, I guess, and for Engano to go, you know, to obviously go somewhere else. 
And there you have it. If you're going to bet on the fight, please go to mybookie.ag and use the promo code ATLAS. Teddy, that's a pretty thorough breakdown of all the action. We've got the preview in. We'll be back, obviously, next week at some point. TBD on when we're going to record, but look for the episode at the normally scheduled uh, posting next next Tuesday morning, and uh, we'll give a full breakdown. I'm dying to hear how the uh, trip to Saudi was and um, all, how, how all the festivities played out. So safe travels to you and Teddy Jr., Tell Floyd we want to have him on the show and um, enjoy yourself over there. It should be a fun trip. Yep. And uh, best to everybody. And God bless everyone. All right, guys. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next week. <laughs>